heard a sermon on Luke. The person Luke, not the book. I don't think I've ever heard a sermon on the person Luke. John? Mark? Jesus? Jesus, yes. But everyone else, you have not heard anything like that. So, um, my topic, my subtopic for today is to introduce the person, the Ma- Matthew the person, Matthew the writer of what we're reading, since that's where we're doing it from, right? We're not going to need it yet, but could we go to Matthew 9, please? Matthew, 9. What? Matthew chapter 9. Just do like Bible Gateway or something. Thanks. All right. The first time I read the Bible cover to cover, the first book I read in its entirety was Matthew. All right, so Matthew has a very special place in my heart. I actually started very ambitious. I started very ambitiously. I wanted to copy, copy the whole book in Chinese. I thought maybe it would help with my translation or something. I gave up after 13 chapters. And I, I went to chapter 1. I glanced down in chapter 1. Oh, good. Genealogy. There's 40 names I'll never use. Right? And um, I mean, my Chinese handwriting improved, but not much beyond that. So after ch- chapter 13, I gave up. I just read the, the rest of the book. But oh, what a blessing it was. Right? It, it was the first book I ever read in its entirety. I, I, was, um, I didn't understand a lot of it, but with God's... Um, God's grace, God's mercy, God's anger, and the reason for his anger that happened each time, his uh, compassion when he healed people. You remember each of his miracles was not to show off, right? It was to heal somebody or or do something for somebody. His compassion was on display, and grace just poured out page after page. I I, I think I was sobbing at some point. Uh, saying, you know, we have such a good God. I never knew this was here. Um, but I, I, I wasn't very introduced to Matthew. Uh, I didn't really know who he was. I was like, who the heck is this guy? And this other, other gospel had a similar story, but the, the guy's name was Levi. Who's that? Well, it turns out they're the same person. And I want to introduce everyone to him so that you can appreciate him too, hopefully. All right, as I said, Levi, Matthew is referred to as Levi in some books. He is, his name was actually, his name was almost Abby's name. Well, before I found out the gender of my oldest baby, I was ready to call him Matthew. I would say to Eunice, I think little Matt's going to like a firmer mattress than a soft mattress. Why do I, why do I like, why do I like him, right? What, what is it that resonates? with me, with his name. Soon we'll find out. Well, we actually first meet this person in chapter 9. Don't, don't focus on the screen. Just This is where we'll end up. But, uh, chapter 9, verse 9, it says, and the, this is Jesus walking along the shore of Sea of Galilee. He sees a man named Matthew sitting at the tax office. He said unto him, follow me. And Matthew got up and followed. We didn't read the beginning of this chapter, did we? But stay with me. Right? I'm going to see if I can help you understand the transition. Earlier in this chapter, you don't have to turn to it. Earlier in this chapter, Jesus had just healed a paralytic, someone was par- who was paralyzed. Right? He came with his four friends. Remember, they lowered him from the roof. And he healed him, but not only that, he forgave his sins. Now, that didn't sit well with the religious leaders, you'll remember. And they were like, only God has permission to forgive sins, right? He's like, and he says, which one is harder, to heal this man uh, or to, 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 to tell a cripple to stand up and walk or to forgive his sins? And the answer, of course, is they're equally impossible. But since he for, said he forgave his sin, he wanted to illustrate that he has the power and authority to forgive sin, um, forgive sin he healed him too. All right, the question then, if you're there, I keep touching. This. The question then, if you're there, should be, all right, you can forgive sins. God lets you forgive sins. Whose sins? How much sin? What kind of sin? 
What's the requirement for forgiveness? You know, how much can you forgive? Questions like that. These four verses answer all of those questions. All of them. And it's a really short but dramatic story. Um, now think with me, right? Jesus at this point in chapter 9, he's been there since chapter 4 in a, in a place, in a very small place, not as small as Nazareth, but still small, called Capernaum. The Sea of Galilee is like this, right? very small. It's on the upper left side-ish. Um, so paralyzed man is healed. His four friends lowered him. They left. The meeting's over. Jesus is walking along the shore. Who's with him? His disciples and the crowd. Um, it was at that time he walked along the shore and saw Levi, saw Matthew. He calls him. And Luke doesn't, I mean, uh, Matthew doesn't say any more, but Luke does. Luke, got, Luke gives us a little more insight. He says, Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. And you say, why is that so, why is that so important? All, Peter, Andrew, James, and John, they, they all did that too, right? It's very important. Because it answers those questions we were asking earlier. You guys want to know something that might be a little surprising? Matthew was probably the worst person in Capernaum. The worst. The most hated person. You say, uh, I don't see that here. The Bible doesn't say that. But we have to know him. We have to know a little bit of history. And all we know so far is his job, right? He was a tax collector. You say, I have a friend in the IRS. He's a good guy. Mm-hmm. It's not, not these guys. Um... You, um, you guys know that during Jesus' time, Israel was under whose occupation? Rome. Rome. It turns out that the conquer nations, they have to pay tax to Rome. All the conquer nations. Um, the Romans oppressed them in many ways, but tax was one of the big ones. All right? So, Israelites especially hated tax, because who did they give their money to? Their tax goes, went to the Lord, right? Every last cent should go to God. And if it goes to a person, the last person they want to give is someone who conquered them, their enemies. So apparently, um, people from the conquer nations was able to buy the right to charge their own people tax. They could buy the tax franchise from the Romans so the Romans don't have to do anything. They'll collect it for them. The Romans would set up uh, like a certain amount to collect and anything else they can collect outside of that, beyond that, they can keep for themselves. And stay with me. There, are two, there were two kinds of tax collectors. The first kind was, um, I think, pretty close to the tax taxes we know. Property tax, we pay that. Income tax, we pay that. And there's even uh, like another uh, tax called registration tax. Basically, if you're alive, you have to pay that tax. If you're dead, you don't have to pay. So you can imagine these people, these tax collectors, right? They're Israelites, and Matthew wasn't the only one. He, they, they would be prone to bribing the rich, lying about how much the middle class has to pay for tax, and pretty much rob from the poor. It's not hard to imagine, right? The people, their own countrymen, they were seen as traitors, wouldn't they be? Giving money to your enemies. So if you were a tax collector, you couldn't go into the synagogue, you couldn't attend religious activities, you couldn't, you couldn't be trusted in court. Your testimony does not count. You were listed among a list of beasts from the Old Testament. You were categorized with... Uh, what do we call it? Murderers, robbers, that kind of thing. Right? Even more interesting. That was, that was just a general tax collector. There's an, in the Hebrew, that tax collector, the name was uh, Gabai. That's what they were called. G-A-B-B-A-I. Interesting, right? That's what we say to IRS when we're done paying our taxes. Goodbye. G-A-B-B-A-I. The second kind of tax collector, um, 
collect a tax on other things. You say, what other things? We can all relate to this. Stuff we buy, stuff we sell, roads we cross, bridges we cross, transactions we conduct on business, um, anything, every harbor, every town you cross. If you had a four-wheel cart, somebody would be there to collect your tax. If your car was only two wheels, maybe they'll collect a little less. They have freedom to open your, um, uh, your letters to check if there's some, something business related and attach a tax to that. It's bad to be a goodbye. It's even worse to be this second category. Their, their name was uh, called Mokus. All right? So there's a goodbye tax collector and Mokus tax collector. With the Mokus, there's two types of those. There's two types of mokuses, right? So we have goodbye, mokus, two, of, two types of mokuses. Um, there was a great mokus. His job was to, he hires, he doesn't collect the taxes himself. He hires somebody else to do it for him so that he can keep his hands clean. The, other than the great mokus, there was another tax collector called little mokus. And they literally collect the taxes themselves because they're too cheap to hire someone else to do it. All right? Guess who Matthew was? Give him what he was and where he was and what he was doing. Matthew was a little mocus of Capernaum, of that whole area. As far as anyone's concerned, he was the worst, all right? the worst, the worst person there. There's a writing by the Jewish rabbis. They said something like this. For a little mocus, repentance is well nigh impossible, virtually impossible. If there's anyone in the world who cannot be granted perform, uh, repentance, it's someone like him. All right? So now, there's great evidence here, right? Because I had a question, I'm sure you had a question. I don't care if Matthew got up immediately or Peter, Peter, Andrew, James, and John got up immediately. Why? Why did they get up so quick? Did Jesus have a commanding voice? Was that it? Was he popular? Did Matthew want money? Matthew has money. Right? I think there's great evidence here. Now we get to the person and heart of Matthew, right? I, I believe he was a convicted person. His heart was prepared. Capernaum, as I said earlier, right, 1,500 people, not that many. He's heard what Jesus said. He's seen what Jesus has done, the healings he's done. He knew exactly what he was getting into, right? He's someone we would call like someone with a broken, broken heart, broken spirit, a contrite spirit. I mean, honestly, what could Jesus offer? He had everything he wants, right? Is Jesus going to grant him new friends? Popularity? Not really. Why would he go after Jesus? Forgiveness, right? Peter, Andrew, James, and John, if this whole Jesus thing goes south, they can go back to fishing. They can. The fish will always be there. Matthew cannot. You can't. If you're a tax collector and you get up and say, goodbye, I'm leaving, you're not getting back there, right? Rome will have someone up there next day, the very next day. So, in a sense, what Matthew gave up was a lot worse than what the other four did. So, you know, so the question, again, how far does forgiveness reach to the worst of sinners? To the adulterers, the murderers, the liars, the self-loving non-believers? Um, so, you know, Matthew lost his career here, but he gained forgiveness and eternal life. He lost his security, maybe, but he gained like an untold adventure, you know, and, and um, he knew himself, and Jesus knew him. That's a little detail, right? Jesus knew his, 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 his heart was ready. And uh, that's why in verse 12, in red, he says it, right? I've not come to call the righteous, but, this, but sinners. 
If Jesus came to call just the righteous, right, people who don't know they're sinful, there'd be nobody in heaven because there's none righteous. No, not, what does it say in Romans? No, not one. Not one. So uh, these four verses say that he was, Matthew, uh, now that he's with Jesus, he was so overwhelmed he threw a dinner party, right, a banquet with Jesus, with his friends. Since he was a tax collector, who could... Who are his friends? Tax what? Tax Other tax collectors. <laughs> Other tax collectors. All right. So the first thing he did was introduce to his, introduce him to his friends. Maybe have Jesus as a guest of honor. Maybe he preached a little bit. We don't know what happened after that. Um, so you know, and, and this man, he eventually penned the first uh, gospel, the longest one, by the way. So that's why, if anyone's going to have a child in the future, consider that name, Matthew. Right? <laughs> it means the gift of Jehovah. It's not a bad name. It's really not. It resonates with me because he is a typical, well, a little more than typical, but he's a prime classic example of a sinner saved by grace. That is the story of every Christian. And he's, you know, he's, he's humble. He didn't say... Oh, I left everything. He wouldn't say that. He's too humble. Luke did. Right? When, when Luke gathered all the evidence. So, the heart of humility is there. And uh, it's it just, those four verses is all we see about him. Supposedly, he was, he was killed by the sword in Africa, eventually. But that's not a part of the Bible, right? Some church tradition says so. Uh, but the key verse of Matthew also is pretty much here, too. Christ came to save the sick who knows they're sick. You know, see, 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 that's why the gospel has to be negative. People have to accept the death sentence of the gospel before the good news is given. All right. Hopefully that gives you some insight into the person. And uh, the next segment.